left off last Thursday, and just I left you with this question where you said we pretty much looked at this example, but notice we have been optimizing for two variables, temperature and substrate concentration. And I asked you what would happen if one of those variables were categorical. So it's easy enough to move around a variable that's continuous, but a categorical variable, for example, using catalyst from one supplier versus catalyst from another supplier, or a type of mixing tank with baffles and a mixing tank without baffles, how would you optimize the construction of the variable? Any suggestions? Let's say you were dealing with temperature and vessel A versus vessel B. How might you go about it? It's actually easier than optimizing continuous variables. No suggestions? No Okay, this is an important point. 
plus 3 represents when xd changes from 0 to 1. We haven't changed xd from 0 to 1. We changed it from minus 1 to plus 1. So that plus 3 represents the effect of going from radial to axial, but it's only half of that. In fact, the true change from radial impeller to axial impeller is to improve y by 6 units, not by 3. The coefficient is 3, but our interpretation of it is that it will boost y by 6. So if we're then optimizing in the system, it simply says that our next set of experiments would use the axial impeller. If we were trying to boost y, we would then use an axial impeller instead, rather than a radial impeller. And in fact, one way to visualize our next set of experiments is to recognize that what we can do after that is just optimize in terms of factor A and factor C, where this point lands up over there, this point lands up over there, this point lands up over there, for example. And now when you look at your data, you're simply looking at that flat face and then you can find your direction of steepest descent. Your direction of steepest descent might be, for example, to go in that direction. So now you reduce down to two factors only, that third binary variable drops out, so you don't have to investigate that anymore. You've already determined that axial impellers lead to better outcomes. So then you're simply optimizing A and C. So categorical variables are very easy to treat. Now, I will also say, don't forget about that categorical variable. As you start to optimize the system and move around, you might move away from where you started and move to a different location. Always check and confirm that in fact the actual impeller still is the better choice. Because once you start moving away, that system might actually change. The, the interaction between the variables might change and it might be that the radial impeller actually is better up here. The axial impeller was better down here. So the fact that axial impeller was higher doesn't hold everywhere. That's the key result. Always come back and verify that that result is still true once you've reached your answer. Okay, so that's that's how one deals with categorical variables. The other important point I wanted to make was figuring out where to stop. We into that that last class. He said we know where to stop because when you add an optimum, everything else around you is worse. So that's easy now to see. We predicted those red curves last time. Everything else around us is lower down. So we're pretty comfortable that we've reached the optimum. This is one of the key advantages of the response of this method, is we guarantee ourselves an optimum. Now, I, I will say also that not everything is, is nice and straightforward like that. There are very well, could be other optimum around you that you've just not seen or discovered. But this might be, those who are taking optimization for simply a local optimum. There might be over there another optimum that you haven't seen yet. Okay. So we always run that risk that we, we're optimizing towards a local optimum and not a global optimum. Let's take a look at some other examples. I want to point out some features that help here. And I'll just show a few, perhaps dim the lights so this is a little clearer. Because the stationary ridge says that you can move anywhere along that 
line and still be optimal. This is a really, really useful thing to discover as an engineer because it tells you now that you can go and select combinations of A and B anywhere along that ridge, still be at your optimum, but you can go find a combination of A and B that's the most economically favorable. So various combinations of A and B, for example, A might be temperature, and B might be the time duration of your batch. You can go find the combination where A equals temperature is the lowest, and that might save you some money because there's less energy requirements. So one of those settings can be adjusted and you still remain along that bridge and find the cheapest economic option. So that allows you to bring in the secondary consideration to optimize. So not only are you optimizing whatever Y might, might be, Y might be, for example, the purity of your product, but if you're along this ridge, it tells you you can achieve the same purity at various combinations of A and B, and you choose a combination of A and B for the cheapest cost. And then a final example, which is actually, um, it's a synthetic example, but it's actually based on a realistic case study here we see a system where you can climb this ridge and there's sort of irregular shapes toward the top. But here's an example of what we often see in human process. That when you approach that peak, there's a sharp drop off down. It's sort of like, say, walking on a knife's edge, where you can achieve that peak, but if you go much further, you'll it drop off drastically. So this is my point I was making in the last class. As you approach the optimum, you take smaller and smaller step sizes. Don't take large step sizes because as you approach the optimum, the optimum is fairly narrowly defined. The optimum peak often is a very small region of space and you don't want to overstep that point. So, so there's an example of a system that will optimize very well up to a point and then falls off very rapidly after that. I'll give a, an actual example of a real system So there's uh, three, three examples of response to this matrix. Now, the final point I'd like to talk about is what we call evolutionary operation. And there's a very important reason why we might want to use these sorts of experiments. So remember I said at the start of the DOE portion of this course that you may almost never be able to do a design experiment in practice. Your company will not really let you go to your distillation column or to your batch reactor and start to change things dramatically. They don't, no one likes that, your boss will be very reluctant to do that. But one way you can get the design of experiment in on your process is by using evolutionary operations. And what you're doing is you're doing exactly what a DOE does, except you take extremely, extremely small steps. And then no one minds. Okay. So no, I'm not suggesting you go and do this like anyone's back without telling them. You could actually do this because no one will probably pick up that you changed anything. That is unethical though. So we still work within our company systems and the regular procedures to get approval to make changes in our process. But when you propose this sort of project, you almost certainly get a yes as an answer, rather than a no from the DOE that I showed you earlier on. Let's take a look at an actual example of how one company uses this very successfully. And then you'll understand the process behind this as well. So the company's Y variable that they're trying to minimize is the cost per ton. So they want to minimize that. And what they did was, this is for a distillation column, for those of you that aren't familiar with chemical engineering, there's two parameters on a distillation column we can adjust to reduce the cost per ton. And that's the reflux ratio. And this system was had a recycle loop as well around the column. So the recycle ratio could be adjusted as 
well. What this company did was they started at a location, let's say down here, and they made extremely small changes to the reflux ratio and the recycle ratio. So the lower bound, for example, was 6.7 for A, and the upper bound was 7.1. We're going to pick that up. That's sort of within the limits of a regular day-to-day -day operational process. The recycle ratio was known between 7.5 and 8.0.
you're that blind person walking on the surface, what does that surface look like to you? Yeah. You sort of reached an optimum and plateaued somewhere around here. Okay. And you go set your reflux ratio and your recycle ratio at that level and you can operate the most Now, the process isn't going to stay there. We're very comfortable as chemical engineers that we have things like our heat exchange of bowels, so the efficiency of that heat transfer deteriorates. We get buildup inside the reactor and the tubing, we get catalyst deactivation, other slow bearing disturbances come into our process. So this optimum might be here for a couple of months, but then it changes and moves around. You might change to a different raw material, we might get heat exchange of fouling, and this optimum might move slowly over there. And then, Three, four, five months later, it might start to move down here again. Okay. So companies that do this successfully, they have automatic computer systems that automatically do the experiments and move and hunt for the optimum in real time. Continually looking for that optimum and seeking to stay on top of the mountain. So we have those systems, they call real-time optimizers, and there's evolutionary operations as part of those. So that's a really interesting and neat way that we can use everything we've learned and still apply it without getting permission from your boss to make drastic changes to the process. Okay, so any questions on evolutionary operation?